All right, let's get started. Uh, yeah, hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for the EI seminar today. Uh, excited to have Mohit here from uh, UMass Amherst. Um, and today uh, he'll talk, talk to us about uh, evaluating and detecting LLM generated text. Uh, excited for you to be here. Um, maybe start with the round of applause. <laughs> Okay, and the microphone is all okay? I think so. Yeah. All right, uh, great. So yeah, I wanted to talk about two uh, directions that my lab has been working on revolving around text that is generated by large language models. Um, so both the evaluation of long outputs and also detecting whether or not a piece of text has been written by uh, a language model. So we'll start with the evaluating um, piece. I just wanted to uh, begin with an example. Um, so here 
is an example of a long form question answering um, instance. So I have this question, if under anesthesia, do you get your sleep needed for the day? Um, and now the critical evaluation problem is always which of these outputs is better, like system one or system two. Um, so if you look at answer one here, yes, I get my sleep needed for the day. However, I'm used to feeling awake and active all the time. So my sleep capital still needs to be Jason permanent sleeper. Um, if you skim over answer two, it's pretty clear that answer one is like pretty garbage and clearly the, the worst answer. Um, answer one was generated by uh, GPT-2 Medium, which was the language model of choice uh, for NLP researchers and people working on text generation even as late as uh, last year. So you can see that it's pretty easy to tell when there are obvious artifacts like uh, BJSON that one out of these outputs is, is uh, clearly worse. However, Let's replace that with this answer. So if you look at this, it's it's much less clear if there are any obvious artifacts present. The answer says no. The unconsciousness induced by both IV anesthetics and inhaled anesthetics is very different from restorative sleep, and it ends with this analogy. Sleep equals charging your phone on airplane mode. Anesthesia equals turning your phone off but not charging it. Um, so here, you know, it's not as clear. We have to actually read answer two. Answer two does not take any sort of position on this question. It just says there's no consensus. It could be, it couldn't be. Uh, studies say different things. Um, so now maybe I'll ask all of you, which answer do you think is better? How many of you think answer one is the better answer? What about answer two? All right, so literally zero people raised their hands, <laughs> clearly because none of you are anesthesiologists or doctors and know the answer. Um, but this is exactly the question that we are asking when we have these kinds of long form question answering outputs, right? We ask humans like mechanical Turk workers to make these kinds of decisions where they really don't have the knowledge that is required. And if not, we ask, uh, you know, like large language models like GPT-4 to judge this. Where does it get that knowledge? To uh, here, you really need to know the facts uh, behind this uh, question in order to make this judgment. All right. So, second question: uh, How many of you think answer one was written by a human? All right. Um, what about uh, how many of you think answer one was written by a large language model? Okay. So, roughly split. Uh, it turns out that answer one was written by a uh, Reddit poster and got a lot of upvotes. Um, answer two was written by uh, uh, like one of the GPT-3 models. It's less powerful than chat GPT. Uh, so this is kind of a foreshadowing of the second part of this talk where we are going to discuss how do we even detect whether a piece of text is written by a human or LLM, because clearly uh, it's kind of difficult now when, in this case, it, it was not. OK, so I'm going to just keep on this task of long-form question answering, because we saw a case where domain expertise is really required to judge the correctness of the answer. So we decided we would just hire people who have this expertise to actually judge these outputs. Um, so for a bunch of different fields, we hired people who have advanced degrees in that field. Uh, you know, they might not know the answer to the question off the top of their head, but they could know where to look. And we encourage them to do research and try and validate the claims that were made in these answers. And not surprisingly, if you just look at these blue bars, the domain experts really value factuality when they're judging like which of the two answers is better. They also value properties like ease of understanding, how well structured it is, how complete the answer is, how many examples it uses, um, things like this. So um, this just highlights some of the important aspects of long form text. There's not just an overall preference. Uh, one answer could be preferred over another in many different aspects. And it's kind of subjective how you weight, like maybe one answer has a factual error, but it's also super easy to understand versus another answer that is completely correct, but um, not well structured, right? So 
We actually found in this paper, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that even these domain experts disagree with each other frequently on what is the best answer. So um, it is very difficult to get an overall preference that everyone who has the relevant background knowledge can agree upon. This is important for you know, alignment algorithms like RLHF where you need to have these rankings of outputs in order to uh, improve your model. And with long form text, it may not make sense to have like one ranking of model outputs, but maybe you should rank them on more fine grained attributes. So I wanted to step back here and talk a little bit more about just in general, what are the high level challenges with evaluation in the age of large language models where we have all these long form outputs. Um, the first one is just that the distribution of errors made by LLMs is very different than everything that we saw in previous text generation systems. We don't have these obvious artifacts or like repetition of text or um, you know, weird capitalization that we can latch onto and design these really simple metrics to detect. Now we actually need to understand the text and um, you know, in some cases, retrieve evidence for it uh, to, to see how good it is. The second thing is like, it's very hard to make a single score to rank these outputs, which we just saw in long form question answering. It's subjective. There's a lot of different aspects to consider. Um, many of you are probably dealing with data contamination in some of your research where we have no idea what data sets these large language models like GPT-4 are trained on. And so it makes it unclear what kind of conclusions we can draw from experiments on traditional benchmarks. Um, the nature of the closed source language models themselves is, is a little unfortunate, right? We don't know, we have no way to inspect their weights. Um, you know, we don't know what algorithms they were, we don't even know what size or architecture they're using. So it's hard to do science, uh, which I'll highlight a little bit later as well. And finally, real world, people in the real world are using these large language models for a huge uh, diversity of tasks that many of which we've never studied before in NLP, especially these kinds of long form tasks. We don't have good benchmarks, evaluations, data sets, or anything like that, but people are actually using the models for these tasks. And so um, this makes it a little tricky to even get started with doing research because there's just no infrastructure. All right, so with all of that, um, I'm gonna dive into one of these aspects since uh, you know, I'm no longer interested in this overall ranking, but rather um, diving deeper into some of these aspects. And I think factuality is one that is uh, of huge importance right now. I think all of us know the, um, you know the capability of chat GPT, but it also hallucinates a lot of things that are not true, and it makes it hard to trust its outputs um, just by itself. So here's a, um, uh, another task. Uh, let's move away from long form question answering and look at biography generation, a simpler task. So here I say write a biography of Bridget Moynihan. And ChatGPT follows my instruction and generates this uh, biography. So the question now is how factually correct is this biography? So I'm not going to ask you all, um, but obviously if you're not like a super fan of this actress, you probably are not able to assess the factuality of each claim that is made in this uh, generation. So um, we develop an approach for uh, assessing the factuality of uh, a long form biography, which kind of uh, operates in two stages. So in the first stage, we decompose the generation into a set of atomic facts. So these are claims that are made um, in this long form text, each of which can be independently uh, validated through uh, the process I'll describe next. So if you look at these atomic facts, Bridget Moynihan is American, an actress, a model, a producer. These are just independent statements that are made in this text. So now let's take an individual atomic fact what we do is we retrieve some text from some large knowledge base. So consider, say, the Wikipedia article of Bridget Moynihan. Um, and we look at what percentage of these atomic units are supported by the Wikipedia article or by the retrieved evidence. 
So if you look at this article, um, it does support that she's an American actress and a model. However, it doesn't say that she's a producer. She was not an actress in Grey's Anatomy, and she did not study at the school. So three of the nine facts here are not supported by her article, and some of them are just uh, contradicted directly by the article. So you can see now we can establish some sort of metric for factuality of a piece of text. We decompose it into a list of facts and then measure like what percentage of those facts uh, are supported by some retrieved evidence. And this isn't perfect, right? There could be issues in both the decomposition and the retrieval. Um, but at least on biographical text, it works pretty well. Um, and so the whole process here is called a fact score. It was, uh, or it will be presented at EMNLP next month. Um, so we implement this decomposition process and verification process by um, prompting large language models. Um, so ChatGPT is very good at generally at this decomposition on biographies. Although of course for different tasks, the decomposition phase itself is very complicated. Um, and verification is just a standard like retrieval augmented prompting setup. So we feed it like the Wikipedia article and the fact and just ask it to generate true or false. Is it supported or not? So we also collected these human annotations on these atomic facts to see how many of them were true or false, like how many did a human verify. Um, and we compared our automatic metric to these human annotations um, and found that it has our automatic method fact score has a very low error rate. So it is able to agree in like 98% of cases with the human's judgment of if a fact is true or false. Now, again, I just want to emphasize this is within the domain of biographies. Um, it is not extended to arbitrary domains or things like long form question answering. Nevertheless, this does allow us to evaluate how good are all of these different large language models at producing factually correct biographies of famous people, right? A very specific task, but it's still kind of interesting. Um, so we have this plot in our paper. So the first bar here is for human written biographies of these uh, people that are found on um, like sites that are not Wikipedia. And you can see that the factuality of these texts is, is very high, it's close, uh, above 90%. Um, there's a big drop off between human written biographies and GPT-4, which is the next best model. Um, about 70% of the facts that GPT-4 generates are supported by the article, but that means 30% of them are not, right? So there's still a lot of hallucination that's happening and you can see that these open source smaller models like stable LM are just like almost pure hallucination. They, they don't, um, they're just making up stuff about these entities. Uh, also somewhat interesting, this uh, Dolly 12B model is from, I think, Databricks. Um, we found that even when we prompt this model to generate biographies of like a specific person, it has this tendency to start generating text about the founder of Databricks. Um, <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's a way to inspect their pre-training data. <laughs> I don't know. Um, all right, so this uh, fact score method is, is a good start, but uh, as I mentioned, it, we have only validated on one specific task and domain. Um, and it also has this issue where we're only measuring the precision of the generated facts. Uh, we are not looking at the recall. So this is a much harder problem. Um, you can see here, write a biography of Mary I of England. Everything ChatGPT generates is true. However, it's omitting critical information about this person uh, historically, that she was known as Bloody Mary for her efforts to restore Roman Catholicism to England. This would be in any biography of Mary I. Um, yeah. Yeah, good question. Maybe you will speak about that later. But um, right now, you're speaking about the factuality of language models that have no no access to any yes information. Right? You could also right. do like you know um, rack or these kind of methods. So That's you right. Want to speak about them. But, uh, uh, I'll speak about them a little bit in in the next part. But um, yeah, in general, those do improve the factuality of the output. Uh, there's actually this recent self rag paper that shows that. Um, but they still make issues, especially 
Well, I mean, there's many cases, right? There could be like contradictions between the uh, retrieved text and the parametric knowledge of the model. Uh, it's still not clear what happens. Um, so I think it definitely reduces hallucination, but it also depends a lot on the quality of the retrieval. Yeah, no um, certain answer there. All right. Um, so I also wanted to highlight this uh, paper, I think, out of Stanford that came out yesterday, I think, that um, used this fact score metric to try and improve the factuality of model-generated text. So basically, like, if you say write a biography of Yo-Yo Ma, you can sample many different biographies from the model, measure which ones of them have the highest fact score, and then try and fine tune the model or use like RLHF. I think they use EPO for the uh, alignment. And it turns out that this process can really improve the factuality of the model generated text. So um, this just, an, I, I wanted to highlight because it shows that once you have a way to measure this uh, factuality, at least in this domain, you can set about improving it. So I think it would be really nice uh, in the future to expand the different domains and see if it actually can generalize. Like if you fine tune on biographies, do you get more factual long form answers? Um, yeah. So you mentioned that this is really optimizing for precision, not recall. Yeah. So does this, do we see some effect from doing this kind of optimization that pushes the model towards making like really generic or uninformative statements because it doesn't want to take risks where it could get penalized on precision? Um, that is a great point. Uh, I don't think they evaluate that in this paper, but um, you know, if they release their outputs, it, it would be really interesting to see because I think that could easily happen. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you guys have been thinking about this question. Have you come up with any way that we could like similarly sort of quantify informativeness or like recall and not just the precision piece? Uh, yeah, we have been thinking about this. We don't have any great ideas right now. Uh, it, it's kind of easy to think about it in the case of like biographies, mm -hmm. uh, especially, but for other tasks like long form QA, it is not as easy to um, evaluate. So yeah, I think it's important. We'll, we're currently working on something like this for the bio biographies, but um, yeah. Uh, again, generalization is, is difficult. That's a great point, though. I, I would love to see the uh, outputs of this method and whether they're more generic. All right, so uh, well, let's continue then. Like, how do we actually do this beyond biographies, and what are the challenges? Um, the problem is, like, with biographies, you have just clear entities and facts, and there's not much variation in what you see. It's very easy to do this decomposition. Um, in QA, it becomes harder, right? So if I have this question, um, has Virginia Woolf's novel about the Ramsey family entered the public domain? I could have a model that spits out yes, and uh, you know that is the correct answer, but I also can't really trust this answer, right? So this again goes to this uh, recall problem where this is correct, but the model has provided us no information to allow us to at least validate that it's actually answering the question and not going, oh, there's a 50-50 chance I can say yes or no. Um, so if you put this into chat GPT, it, it does not give you a yes or no. It instead gives you this paragraph that actually kind of justifies why it arrived at the final answer, which it is currently in the public domain. So this is great. It correctly identifies the novel uh, in question, and it correctly identified that it's in the public domain. But it makes this error, right, that um, the, the novel entered the public domain in 2021 when it actually entered the public domain in 2023. So now you have this uh, interesting challenge where the answer to the question is correct overall, but there's one factual inaccuracy in the answer. And so evaluation here becomes a little challenging. So, um, we had this uh, recent paper called Fresh LLMs where we decided to evaluate the output of these QA um, in this QA task in two settings. So one was a relaxed setting where only the answer had to be correct. And the other was a strict setting where every single fact in the answer also had to be correct in addition to the final answer. Interestingly, some of these models will give you a really factually correct explanation and then finally just get the answer wrong. Um, I think this has also been observed with many of these chain of thought uh, style papers. 
Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that we have, uh, this is also a benchmark for these search engine augmented uh, language models. So some of the questions here are like, what is Brad Pitt's most recent movie as an actor? Where the answer to this question changes, uh, you know, relatively quickly, right? So uh, you need to have like up-to-date information included in the prompt or in whatever other setup you have in order to answer the question correctly. It also has some false premise questions. So in which round did Novak Djokovic lose at the 2022 Australian Open? Uh, here, the, the like ideal model would, instead of answering this, rebut the premise of the question and say, he didn't play in the tournament, so I can't answer this question. Um, but basically, we find that, um, again, these closed source models are the best at this task. Uh, this, this plot here is without any search engine augmentation, but when you add that, it, it uh, basically shows the same trend. Um, but we, we also see this like difference between the strict evaluation performance and the relaxed evaluation performance as some way of quantifying the hallucination of the model. Um, so you can see that GPT-4 in the relaxed setting, it's generally getting the answer correct about 50% of the time, but like almost half of those correct answers are have some degree of hallucination in them. Um, and so uh, another thing I wanted to highlight about this work is that it required the authors to do over 50,000 um, human judgments of answer factuality, uh, which takes a ton of time. Um, and again, we sh we're showing in um, some very recent work that you can automate this process uh, similar to fact score. Um, but to you know, validate your metric, you still need to collect the human judgments. And um, yeah, it, especially for models that like to generate a ton of text, like GPT-4 is very verbose. It takes a lot of time to, to do this. OK, so um, yeah, I wanted to kind of uh, switch gears really quickly and um, talk about how, in this case, it is possible to hire people to judge these outputs, right? If, if I knew like an anesthesiologist and I could pay them some like massive hourly rate, I could probably get them to read these answers and mark them up. But what about a task like this? Uh, translate the following Catalan novel to Swahili. So here is a case where it may not even be possible to hire anyone who is fluent in both of these languages and can tell you for certain how good this translation is. Um, it's also interesting because this is a task that GPT-4 can actually do, right? Despite the fact that it probably has seen no or very little parallel data in this uh, particular language pair. So I think some of these uh, tasks that people are using these LLMs for, you have to evaluate them using um, non-experts. So in this case, maybe I can use a native Swahili speaker who does not know Catalan, and they would be able to detect some subset of the errors that are made in this translation. But they can't talk about cases where maybe like a particular span was mistranslated from the Catalan because they don't have knowledge of that language. Um, so how do you get at this? Uh, I just wanted to highlight this uh, platform that we uh, recently built called uh, LitMT. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, share this really quick. So here, uh, we are interested in this problem of studying the translation of a novel to many different languages, this uh, literary machine translation problem. But it's hard to find people to evaluate it. So we built this platform where we have all these books that uh, have never been translated before. So it's also kind of like improving the accessibility of these works. Um, so this book, The Mother Whale, was originally written in Catalan. And we have it translated by these large language models using you know, various prompting methods that people have developed for translation uh, into um, many different languages. So this is the Swahili translation. So you know, obviously, it's a tough task to like, get people to actually use this site. Um, you know, we are hoping people will, but initially, we're probably just going to hire people to you know, uh, read through these translations. Uh, let's just switch to the English view here. Um, so this is the Catalan English translation. So the thing that we're hoping will happen is 
in addition to like enjoying these books, people will point out things that are notably wrong in the target language. So for example, here, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but there's this uh, paragraph break in the middle of a sentence. So during the first period, comma, line break, you walk <coughs> along the beat. So it would be good if I can have someone who's reading this book also just comment or say something like, why is there a paragraph break? Um, and we're going to store this comment. We can later use it for evaluation in this direction or further improving the, the models. Um, but again, this is an uh, instance of uh, an annotator here, the reader, who's only familiar with the target language. So you're not going to capture all possible errors this way. Um, but this is like one of our goals is to have this more human-centered evaluation where the people doing the evaluation are actually, you know, they are incentivized to uh, have better models to read more of these books. So if you're interested in this, uh, we just launched it. So please sign up if you're, um, you know, at all curious about some of these different cultures and languages. Um, I'm sure the translations in some of these languages are not the best, so they could use a lot of improvement. All right. Um, so going back to this, um, yeah, so I, we have a lot more work on translation that I, I won't talk about here. Uh, I wanted to switch instead to another task that uh, people are using these LLMs for, which is uh, summarization. So in summarization, um, you know, you might have one or more large documents and you're interested in producing um, a summary. Uh, and just like for factuality and uh, other aspects, the um, coherence and faithfulness of these summaries has dramatically improved with uh, large language models. It's improved so much that we have a lot of hype around specifically this summarization task. So this is a figure from the LangChain library that essentially implies that you can take any sort of data, like a YouTube video, arbitrary PDFs, multiple files, you just feed them into this LLM app cloud and you get a summary of the data. And, you know, a lot of companies are raising like huge amounts of money off of figures like these, but it's really unclear how well the models can actually do this kind of summarization. And it's further unclear how you even evaluate how good the summaries are in these kinds of situations. So one, um, one thing that is highlighted by this figure is that people would like to be able to summarize very long and complex texts. Um, and we know that these transformer language models are limited in how much text uh, you can actually pass into them at once, right? So if I wanted to summarize a very long book, the way that all of these frameworks do it now is we split the book into non-overlapping chunks each of which can be passed into a language model um, by itself. And then we summarize each chunk uh, independently of all the other chunks using like, you know, prompting GPT-4. Then there's this task where you take summaries of adjacent chunks and you ask the model to merge the summaries together into, you know, a higher level summary. And you just repeat this process, this merging process until you're left with a single summary, and that's your summary of the whole book. So, like, intuitively, this process is not perfect, right? You don't consider dependencies between different chunks. And if you think about doing this as a human, if I just give you, like, five random pages of a novel and ask you to summarize it, you may have no idea, like, what the actual context uh, behind several events or characters is, you may not be able to do this task properly. So there's, uh, you know, a lot of issues doing it this way. You break a lot of these discourse dependencies. It's also like very nice, this, this figure, but if you actually look at the implementation, which again is just a bunch of prompts, uh, this also presents problems for, uh, you know, seeing if you are interested in the question, how good is an LLM at summarizing a book, you have to deal with this issue of, prompting, right? So this is a prompt that, that we were using in our work um, for merging these two summaries. 
So merging two summaries is an extremely complex instruction, right? You see it here. Um, so we wrote this instruction, but it's not clear what the uh, you know relative role of each of these instructions is to the um, you know uh, overall summary quality, right? So this last sentence here says the summary must be within X words and could include multiple paragraphs. If we get rid of this, do the summaries on average get longer or do they get shorter? Um, we also have this sentence: you should organize a summary chronologically, right? If we get rid of this, does the model actually produce summaries that are out of order or does it do this anyway? What if we say you are the most amazing summarizer of books to have ever existed? Does this improve my performance? Um, similarly, there was actually a paper that showed that let's take a deep breath, adding that to your prompt improves the performance of the model, right? Is it necessary for us to evaluate the effect of let's take a deep breath on our summarization system. I would hope not, but you know, maybe it is something that just makes the summaries like infinitely more coherent, right? I would hope not, but um, you know, this is another challenge in the era of LLMs is this different, there's infinitely many ways to word these prompts and it's hard to answer the overall question of can the model do this or not? It just needs to be like prompted in the right way and maybe it can do it. So uh, all that said, we decided to just bypass this problem and have one prompt that seemed to produce good summaries. And we um, really wanted to evaluate how coherent these summaries were. So this is a recent uh, iClear submission um, where one, uh, so another challenge I want to highlight here is the data contamination issue. So if you take a bunch of famous books, like say, um, I don't know, A Tale of Two Cities, there have been numerous summaries written about this book that are published on the internet that are available in the common crawl that these models have memorized. So what we do is we buy 100 books that were recently published, like in the past few months. Um, importantly, these books have not been summarized before, or at least uh, we couldn't find any summaries online. So even if the model saw the book in the pre-training data, it did not see a summary. Um, although, you know, one of our reviewers was like, you can never be sure. So you know, that's, that's always a criticism, <laughs> I suppose. Um, one challenge that, uh, another challenge is that because we are trying to avoid this data contamination issue, we also don't have any reference summaries to evaluate against. So evaluation here becomes more complicated. Um, and so the, the first uh, part of this work was just looking at the coherence of the summaries. So we found that this kind of merging process of two summaries introduces a lot of weird coherence errors that are, they're subtle, but if you're a human reading the summary, you would be like, what is happening? Uh, so this is an example here where this is part of a summary. Um, the, uh, one of our annotators was like, why would Callista know something about the investigation? So there was some important motivation or knowledge that was not present in the summary that made this uh, sentence confusing. And another annotator was like, why did the summary just shift to Thea's perspective from the previous sentence? Um, so this suggests that there was something going wrong in this like merging or summarization process um, that uh, you know, presented itself in this like bit of incoherence. So um, we found that through a large, well, like we, we acquired over 2,000 annotations of these coherence errors, and the vast majority of them were omissions. So there was some critical information that the human needed to understand that wasn't present in the summary that made it incoherent. So it might have been a character wasn't introduced, or an event was like referred to, but not um, like described earlier on or the motivation or some like causal link between two events was not mentioned that made it incoherent. Um, and so we were interested in, um, you know, building an automatic metric to discover these things. Now that we know what the error distribution looks like for these summarizers, can we detect them automatically? So we built this uh, metric that we, similar to fact score called books, books, or wow, well, never, uh, pronounce that. <laughs> uh, we named it that because these are long books. Um, so 
similarly to fact score, we decompose the summary into here sentences. Um, it's harder to decompose it into like atomic units like we did with the bi biographical text. Um, now, given that we, uh, we go through sentence by sentence and we ask GPT-4 to identify whether one of these like eight error types that we observe here uh, occurs in the uh, sp specific sentence. And so for this summary here, we found uh, two such stands that we also make the model generate a question for. So the question is intended to highlight the incoherence. So here, what is the significance of the secret costume party? That's suggesting that this information may not be salient to the summary. The second one, who is John? So this character John is referred to, but never introduced. So we don't know who this person is in the summary. Then we measure like what percentage of the sentences are free of these kinds of coherence errors. And just like in the previous work on factuality, we are able to validate that this metric um, aligns well with the human judgments that we've collected of, of these different types of errors. So again, just like the factuality work, we can now use our metric to evaluate a bunch of uh, LLMs on this like book length summarization task. Um, not surprisingly, again, like the closed source GPT-4 and Claude uh, are the best summarizers that we found. Um, interestingly, we only have Llama 2 7B, this like instruction tune model here. The 70 billion model did not fo follow our instructions at all. It just did not generate summaries. Um, most of the time it just regurgitated parts of the prompt. So. Um, yeah, I think there's clearly a huge gap between the instruction following abilities of the open and uh, closed source models. Uh, another interesting thing is we, we know like some of these models like Claude 2 and the new GPT-4 have very large context windows, like up to 100 or 128K. It turns out that Claude, at least, is not taking full advantage of that uh, big context size to generate more coherent summaries. In fact, if you use a chunk size of 2000, uh, 2048 uh, tokens, its coherence is actually higher than if you use a chunk size of 88,000 um, tokens. So um, you know, maybe these models are technically capable of processing such long sequences, but their actual understanding of those sequences is, is still unclear. Um, yeah, and uh, finally, like we're now trying to combine this fact score and book score metric together to do a faithfulness evaluation of summarization. So right now we've only valued coherence. Faithfulness refers to how accurate is the summary? Like are all the events in the summary actually things that happened in the book or not? All right, so maybe I can stop here in case there are any questions on this. We have a question online. Sure. Uh, Rashmi asks, uh, which evaluation metrics have you been uh, used to measure the reduced level of hallucination? Oh, uh, yeah. So we were mainly using the fact score metric to evaluate um, uh, hallucination. And for the fresh LLM work, that was all human evaluation. All right. So, um, can, oh. Sorry, can I, can I ask one more? Yes. Which is, so, you know, as soon as you have an evaluation metric, you have a target for optimization. Uh, right. How hard would it be to just now, like, train for coherence in this yeah, way? Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, we already saw that happen for fact score. Uh, and it's unclear how these, like, models that have been tuned on factuality actually generalize beyond these domains. I think it's a little harder for book score because you have all these like different merging steps that um, require different inputs. So at least the training process is more complex. But yeah, I, I don't see why it couldn't be optimized. I, I think that's an issue uh, for sure. But uh, I think also this happens in general with any metric. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I was also, I was wondering whether uh, the same thing that I was asking about for fact score applies to book score around the yes. call. It's, it would seem like for, you know, as the length of the text gets longer, the probability that you're going to be omitting key facts definitely increases. Yeah. 
So is, is that also a limitation of this book? Score? Yeah, so uh, I can answer that better this time. We did do a qualitative analysis where um, the first author and I, well, the first author read two of the books herself. Um, I kind of just skimmed through. Uh, and we, we wanted to answer this question, like, are all of the events um, that are in the book well represented in this uh, summary? Yeah. And even like the summaries that have no coherence errors, like plot two, um, it has several summaries that have no coherence errors, but the way that it represents some of these uh, events is completely false. Um, like it gets timelines wrong, it gets relationships between characters wrong. So it sometimes says like, you know, this character is, uh, is the son of this other character when that's not true. Um, so yeah, overall the faithfulness is definitely lacking, but it, it's not at all clear how to measure um, that because in this setting you have like potentially multiple long spans of the document that correspond to one um, individual sentence in the summary. Um, yeah, I think the best evaluation for this is what we did where you read the book and then you can actually um, mark the spans up, but very expensive to scale. I mean, I think like an interesting property of both of these scores is that they assume that the underlying model that you are evaluating is trying to be informative. Yeah. So like, true. you know, I, I could posit like a very simple, like, you know, n-gram based model. Sure. That would probably get pretty high books. Yeah. yeah. You could gain um, uh, yeah. or fact score for that. Yeah. Matter, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but would not necessarily be. Yeah. Actually, we observe that with uh, chat GPT sometimes, like uh, it generates very vague sentences that are like, you know, the book's theme is generally of like, I, I don't know, a young love or something. Whereas Claude and GPT-4 generate these very specific, uh, very detailed sentences that have much more room to be incoherent. So I, I agree, that's a that's a big issue with the, the metric right now. And it's another aspect that needs to be evaluated. Or is there like any kind of normalization for length? Right, or like if I just say, you know, this book is about main character. Like, do I get 100%? Uh, yeah, so it, with our uh, current approach, you would. Like, one of one sentence is coherent. Uh, that's why we put the length here. We, we also did, like, some simple other metrics. Like, uh, so Llama 2, for instance, has a lot of repetition, like, just duplicated sentences. So, of course, it could still get a high book score, but just repeat the same sentence over and over again. I think all of those are just, like, kind of, separate things that we're measuring here to give added context to the, yeah, you can't take this metric out of context. Um, that's a good question. All right, um, so I think I'm out of time, or? Uh, I guess you have uh, 10 more minutes. Okay, great, so I'll, I'll just uh, skim through the, the next part and um, happy to take more questions. So that's all I wanted to say about evaluation. Um, I also wanted to talk about this detection problem because I think this is a, a place where um, maybe you can actually do some more cool like algorithmic work nowadays. Um, so obviously we saw in this example, it's easy to detect that this thing was output by a language model that has all these obvious artifacts harder in this situation. In general, we see there's a huge appetite for detecting LLM generated text, right? So teachers mainly. As a faculty member, I've been on several of these hearings where people want to, or committees, people want to detect whether their students are writing their essays with chat GPT. And you have several technologies too, like turnitin.com released this uh, AI detector with a 98% confidence rating. It's totally unclear what that means. Clearly it's not very good because there's been so many of these false accusations of using AI assistance based on these detectors that um, didn't actually happen in practice. The consequences of this are obviously huge, so you want to minimize false positives. But I wanted to highlight like an even more insidious application of these LLM-generated text. So this is from a forum called Black Hat World, where um, people are basically trying to make a lot of money by um, creating a bunch of websites that draw traffic and then optimizing the ranking of those websites in the search engine results. 
So this person asks, I have to generate 100 articles. I have chat GPT. What's the best method to generate 500 word articles that pass the AI content detection tools? Um, this forum post has like hundreds of comments. I just wanted to highlight one by this member, Herkus. I have almost 10 automated AI WordPress sites. None of my content, content gets flagged as an AI. So essentially what this person is doing is they generate an article using ChatGPT, and then they use Grammarly Premium to paraphrase every single sentence in ChatGPT's output. Um, so he says, uh, they say, each article takes me about one minute to just like click accept on every Grammarly suggestion and then post it. They say it gives the content a more human vibe, um, but also this like act of paraphrasing is able to bypass all of these LLM detectors. So, you know, this is happening right now. Uh, like there's so many fake art, uh, websites with uh, articles that are generated by these models that we already know are making up huge amounts of, like there's a lot of hallucination and just fake stuff being posted. And also, like, when you're training, say, OpenAI is training GPT-8, do they really want to train their model on text that's generated by, you know, chat GPT? Probably not. So it would be good to have a way of detecting this. The way these detectors work at a high level is, is pretty straightforward. So given a piece of text, you pass it to a detector, it gives you a score, and you uh, measure whether that score is above some threshold. If it is, you say it's detect, uh, uh, generated by an LLM. And importantly, you can adjust the score to um, minimize false positives. So you can adjust this threshold such that, say, only there's a 1% false positive rate. Um, so then you're really measuring, like, what is your detection accuracy at a very, very low false positive rate? So OpenAI tried this. They had a text classifier. They trained it on half GPT-generated text, half human text, and they put it online. Um, and then they shut it down a few months later. They said it is no longer available due to its low rate of accuracy. Um, as I'll show in, in this paper I'm going to talk about, it is like beyond bad, um, their classifier. Uh, a more interesting approach is watermarking. So in watermarking, you actually modify the decoding algorithm of the language model. Uh, essentially, at every um, time step, you randomly partition the vocabulary into red tokens and green tokens. So there's one red subset, one green subset. Um, the partition is dependent on the identity of the previous word or the previous A words. Uh, and then you just upweight the probabilities of all the green tokens. So when you sample from the model, you're more likely to sample a green token. So a non-watermark language model will have you know, roughly equal red tokens and green tokens. A watermark model will have way more green tokens than expected. And you can detect this and uh, say with a high degree of confidence that this text was generated by a language model. So yeah. So, so you, this split between, like this is, a, you know, you have two disjoint sets of tokens, yes. the green and the red ones. And you modify them doing sampling, or like because it seems kind of super harsh for me to, like, for all one generation to just say you can only allow like half of all tokens. Uh, so it's a soft uh, upweighting. So you're basically adding some like bias term, which is a, a hyperparameter, to like softly bias the generation of green tokens. So the model still predicts its probability distribution. You essentially, yeah, add some term that. Uh, increases the chance of sampling a green token. But and it's not like a hard cutoff. For one model forever, so there would be a chat GPT, one more watermark, one bias term, that's it. Yeah, the so bias term good. generally is not dependent on yeah. the time step. Um, yeah. So another thing to note um, is that watermarking doesn't work on low entropy uh, tasks, right? So even if I add this bias term, if one of the tokens had 99% probability, I'm going to sample that token regardless. So uh, actually a lot of these detection methods don't work with um, low entropy. So imagine like translation, for example, as a task where it's very hard to uh, watermark. So the thing I want to highlight is this robustness to paraphrasing attacks. We saw this with that uh, forum member, like they're using paraphrasing to evade all of these tools. Um, you can think about how it affects watermarking, right? If you 
if the partition, the vocabulary is dependent on the previous word and I change the previous word, I get a new uh, partition and I can no longer reliably detect uh, greedy or red tokens, like what the model actually did. So we have this uh, paper appearing at NeurIPS that's on this topic. Um, and uh, this is what happens to watermarking. So let's say this is a watermark model and the detector predicts that this is AI generated if I pass it to a paraphrase model, I see a lot more red tokens and the uh, prediction becomes unclear. So let's just look at how uh, much this affects the performance of these models on um, a simple task of given two sentences of a Wikipedia article generate their remaining uh, sentences. So this is just an arbitrary open-ended generation example. You can see that of all these metrics, watermarking is very effective when you have no paraphrasing. It's like 100% uh, effective with GPT-2 XL. The OpenAI classifier is horrible even without paraphrasing. It's a 21% detection rate at a false positive rate of 1%. So you can't use this, uh, basically. Um, so when you do paraphrasing, watermarking's effect effectiveness drops basically in half. So it only detects 50% of AI-generated text successfully. This detect GPT method drops from 70% to 4%. So this is you know, just uh, quant quantifying what that person on the forum said, that paraphrasing can bypass all of these kinds of detectors. So I guess I'll just conclude with one method that we proposed instead that is more robust to paraphrasing, but also has its own new set of issues. Um, and that's just a simple retrieval-based approach. So let's say I am OpenAI, and I know all of the text that my model has generated, right? I have stored a database of every single chat GPT generation. So now I can just turn this problem into retrieval. Let's say I'm a teacher, and I want to know if this essay was written by chat GPT or not. Maybe OpenAI can give me access to uh, basically uh, a retriever where I can feed the essay into the retriever, it will retrieve like the most similar chat GPT generation and then measure some sort of semantic similarity um, between the retrieved text and the generation, uh, sorry, and the input to say whether or not this uh, um, generation was produced by chat GPT or not. So you can see that depending on the similarity score used here, it could be very robust to paraphrasing as long as the semantics of the um, output are unchanged. So we tried this and it, it works really well. It's a lot more robust to paraphrasing. So this is a different task of long form question answering. We see that the effectiveness of retrieval degrades um, much less uh, compared to watermarking and existing approaches. Um, However, I will just conclude with um, some of the issues with retrieval. Uh, I think why OpenAI has not already implemented something like this is because they do not want to give query access to all generations uh, to arbitrary um, users. Um, there's a lot of very interesting membership inference attacks that you could think of when you have access in this way. So for example, if I'm a malicious teacher and I want to know um, you know, whether this piece of protected information was ever input into chat GPT, I could probably do that with infinite queries to the detector. Um, with infinite queries, I might be able to see if any piece of text had ever been generated by chat GPT. So, um, yeah, there's basically in conclusion, uh, I think this problem is not uh, you can't just solve it perfectly, but you can definitely make it harder for people to evade the detection method. Um, new attacks will always be invented, um, and new detectors will probably be invented too, um, but it is a very fun uh, area to work on and also quite impactful, I think. All right, so I will just end here, and thanks. Um, if we have time for questions, maybe we'll take one, if anyone has any last. Uh, we have a couple questions online, but... Okay, uh, you can. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. I was just curious about um, the, the last method you mentioned, that you could basically store, like, as, a, as an LM provider in that respect, yeah. you, would, you could just store all the queries ever, ever been. Right. Um, like, 
let's let's assume that there will be only there would be a monopoly of like one provider. Okay, OpenAI yes. is the only one, and you know they have access to everything. Would that even be an efficient, like, potential solution? I'm just worrying what the what the performance and like. You mean like as the number of uh, generations increase? Yeah, I'm just imagining that they're like billions or maybe even trillions yeah, yeah, yeah. of stuff. Uh, that's a great question. Um, we couldn't study this because you know you actually need uh, model generations, like you need a huge amount of them. So we were able to get uh, a corpus of 15 million generations just because of our Google collaborators. 